Um, let me give you a little background to this. I am Jewish, and uh, I this last year with the increase in uh, in hate crimes. You'll see there's very little difference in the definition. I'll get to that between hate crimes and terrorism, <laughs> domestic terrorism. Um, and uh, I just finally got tired of it all. And I've been tired of it for a long time, but I've, I've kind of been on mute uh, since college. Um, when I was in college, a long time ago, and I won't tell you how long ago, but um, I used to, as a student, I joined a student organization of international students and American students, and uh, I was in it, that was my short skirt, long hair days. And, yes, there was such a time. And uh, one day, the president of the Arab Student Association walked in and suddenly grabbed my arm, twisted it behind my back, and bent me over. And the room was full of people, and everyone, everyone went silent. And he announced, I think in a very patriarchal way, this is what we do to the Jews. And I've always had a stubborn streak uh, in me, which eventually took me to Israel. <laughs> but this was before then. And, and I said, yeah, and this is how everyone sees an Arab. And he just froze. And then he didn't know what to do because, I mean, he couldn't exactly beat me up in front of everybody. And he finally let me go and he went out of the room. What lasted with me was, I mean, from him I wasn't too surprised because I already knew about some of the issues. But what was a lasting effect on me was that no one moved and everyone was silent. And there were even Jewish Americans in the room. And then no one came up to me afterwards. And they just went on like nothing had happened. And I never forgot that. Um, I also have had other incidents in my life growing up in America where um, I've had issues uh, about being Jewish in America. But um, what I got interested in was what are the theories behind anti-Semitism because it just goes on and on and on for centuries. So I did some research on some of the theories, theoretical backgrounds. I'll also try not to get political, <laughs> which is a little difficult sometimes. Um, so I made, finally made this presentation because one of the things that I have always believed in, and I'm in social work and do a lot of have done a lot of advocacy in my life, in the field, and for the profession, is I don't believe in remaining silent, whatever those consequences might be. So uh, let's. I hate these things. Um, First of all, I wanted to give a definition, and I might sit down once in a while, guys. So, I don't know if you saw the town halls last night, but Amy Komachar was, was sitting, sitting down every once in a while. Um, the men were standing the whole time. Okay. Um, this is a, a lot of people who have never been exposed to this issue really don't know what it is. And really what it is is that, you see, and, and actually I've been teaching diversity ever since I got here 19 years ago, every single semester. It used to be in, on campus and now it's online. Prejudice, they say, is something, you know, if you put babies in a crib, they don't know anything, right? 
they don't know what prejudice is and they don't know what discrimination is. So this is all learned behavior that comes through socialization. And prejudice is that, you know, basically you have attitudes, conscious or otherwise, that you've absorbed that some you may have chosen to absorb as you got older cognitively, and others you've absorbed just kind of through osmosis, through your family and your culture and your environments. Discrimination is actually putting it into action. So, of course, what this guy did, um, the international student did, of course, was an act of discrimination. And, it, of course, because it was fairly violent, um, it was more than that. Um, but the issue about anti-Semitism is that we talk about racism and discrimination of, towards certain racial groups, and I will get into that. And we've had a history in the United States of certain groups traditionally, historically, being discriminated against. But with anti-Semitism, it, it has even gone be beyond discrimination. It's almost always about <laughs> annihilation. And when you look at rhetoric from certain groups, we, we are all aware of what, what happened. I hope you're all aware. Um, because there was a survey that just came out that said young people, that 50% of young people are unaware of the concentration camps and the Holocaust. They don't know what it is um, by the Nazis. But it's always been about annihilation. And this is, this is something that I think that people need to take note of that it's more than just race or color. And I'm not saying that other minority groups haven't faced annihilation. We know that Native Americans did. We know that blacks and African Americans, which they weren't called in those days during slavery, um, were killed. Um, we, we know that there have been groups that have experienced. But throughout history, it's been about with Jews, it's been about annihilation. I was teaching, a, I teach a class on spirituality and aging that I wrote from scratch, and it's about culturally diverse views of healing and aging. And I had a student, one, one section is on Judaism. And a student came in online and said, why is it the, the Jews are always being picked on? What, what is it about them? And I wrote back and said, why are you blame, blaming the victims? Why don't you blame the perpetrators? Of course, you didn't know any better. Um, okay? We know that since the last election, <coughs> since the last presidential election, there has been a tremendous increase in hate crimes and attacks on Jews, and they are increasing. The ADL is the Anti-Defamation League, and if you see the statistic, there has been, in 2018, they said that there has been over a 99% increase over what hate, uh, hate attacks that were on Jews in 2015. And that this, in 2019, I have bibliography all the way through this, <laughs> that over half of hate crimes have been targeted against Jews in this country. Now, it doesn't read that way in the media. You hear about this individual attack, you hear about that individual a church, a mosque. It doesn't read this way. So people don't under, people are not aware of what is really going on. And should they care? Should you care? If you're, if you're not a Jew, Maybe you shouldn't care. I don't know. I think you should care because Americans in our democracy should never be silent about injustice. Here's the FBI's uh, 
definition of hate crime. And um, you can read that. And they, at this point, when you see that a hate crime has, I mean, that an attack has been classified as a hate crime, then it's a criminal offense. If it's, if it's defined as an act of domestic, excuse me, domestic terrorism, they may or may not go through the court system. It's a whole different process. But if you really, one is the FBI's is aimed more at individuals doing individual attacks, whereas Homeland Security, and for two or three years during the summer, I was teaching online for another university uh, a domestic terrorism course to the military and intelligence people. And their view is more on group attacks with group aims, oftentimes from uh, international, uh, sponsored by international ex uh, organizations. Both contain extremism, elements of how we would define scream <coughs> extremism. So, uh, and I put this up here because they said that political thought and action that intentionally employs intimidation. You can see how this is all overlapping. Of course, if you're the target, who cares? Um, no, and you do care. But, but Quite a few years ago, I published a paper on the psychology of terrorism, and Albert Bandura, who in the psych psychological or psychiatric circles, wrote a very interesting article on terrorism and its, and its dynamics. One is that we know this now, everyone knows this, that when you're attacked and you're innocent, right? Because the first thing is, what did I do? <coughs> we also see this with domestic violence. But, you know, what did I do? And it's people who are groups that use fear. And even if they're, they're caught and killed or whatever, they have they achieved their objective of instilling fear? So when you go through, go to the airport, and you're in line, are you checking everybody there? We didn't used to. In Israel, we do it as a matter of course. It's no big deal. Um, are you checking for suspicious objects? In Israel, we do it all the time. It's no big deal. But it's no big deal because you know that everyone around you knows what to do. Most people have been, uh, are still serving in the military uh, on reserve or active duty. The point is, what drives a person to commit an attack? And when they are a perpetrator, at what point and for what reason do they disengage from the person that they've targeted? So that process of disengagement allows them to give themselves internal sanction, permission, that that's okay and you as the targeted victims become like pieces of furniture. You have no meaning. And they can justify however they want what they're doing. I, I wanted to give this, this part as a frame. Um, here, this was after the attack in Pittsburgh. Uh, a family from the Tree of Life uh, synagogue. None of us picture that it'll be us, but you never know. God willing, it won't. So, there are theories. One uh, book that I read said, well, what is it about Judaism that it just continues on and on and on? You have to remember these are theories. We're not saying that they're factual reasons for people. There are basically, and I'm not an expert, I'm not a religious expert, so, okay. But the Jews, as you know, 
in, in, for those of you who have looked at the Bible or gone to church, it was the first monotheistic religion. In other words, they were the first one, the first group, and they weren't called Jews in those days. They were the first group where there was a direct communication between them and God, or however you want to call him. I call him Hashem, which is a Hebrew name. And they were the first monotheistic one. And then what happened was that it wasn't just an issue of faith and belief. It was an issue of being an organized community such that when Moses went up on the mountain, as far as we know, he was given the Ten Commandments, upon which the United States Judeo-Christian basis is off of the Ten Commandments, right? He gave a system of laws about how to live your life, but and also laws that contained a society, that defined a society and as a community, and in addition, if you weren't religious or whatever, it still gave you an identity as a people. And so that peoplehood has bothered a lot of groups, historical events through history. And I'll get into that. So, first of all, how do you deal with that? That, you know, it wasn't your people that got cho <laughs> chosen which could be a burden, but it wasn't your people or your group, and it's the issue of how people interpret this in terms of, not in terms of faith or belief, but in terms of power. And Jews basically don't go out, well, I'm not a rabbi, so I'm not sure, but basically don't go out and proselytize, basically. Um, but it gave us a, excuse me, a group identity, which gave us an allegiance to peoplehood, and we had uh, an overarching principle of what we call tikkun olam. Tikkun means repair, and olam means the world. In other words, you go out and do your good deeds and you try to make society as best you can, whatever country, whatever society you're living in. And this is basically a principle that is applied to all different Jewish sects. So we have this thing about this as being the chosen or the identity issue, and there's, I'm not an expert on the explanation of the Star of David. This is your Torah, which is your Old Testament, written in Hebrew. Really hard, I mean, I've got to tell you, Hebrew is hard to learn. I had to learn Hebrew in Israel, and you have to go from right to left. Um, and my, my writing is horrible. I had a professor, I got my bachelor's in Israel, and I had a professor say, Patricia, I tried to read your paper, but I didn't understand anything. Okay. And she was, and my Israeli professors were, at that time, were all Holocaust survivors, people with numbers on their arm. I mean, they were outstanding scholars. And then the issue of peoplehood, that you have an allegiance to your people in terms of identity, but you are an American. And we don't read about you know, contributions of Jews to American history, I mean, for the most part, okay? But we are in all over the world, and being Jewish is not really a race, because you have Jews from all different countries, from all different racial backgrounds. Over 52% of Israelis are brown-skinned, I was there when the mass immigration came in from the Soviet Union. We all wondered if they were really Jews. No. <laughs> and then we had a mass migration from of Jews from Ethiopia, mass migration from North African countries, Iraq, uh, people who walked over the Atlas Mountains and ended up on the shores of Turkey for a boat to pick them up. 
we had Jewish community, believe it or not, they found the remnants of a 12th century BCE synagogue in Beijing. So, we're not really a race, but we are a people. It's just that most Jews you are, I, would, I don't have the statistics for that, but most Jews you find in America are white skinned. Okay? Now, Sartre, Paul, John Paul Sartre, can you believe this? Wrote a treatise on anti Semitism in France. And what was going on there was a debate in the French legislature about how to deal with the Jews at, during his time, which was well, if we have Jews in France, they can individually say they're a Jew. But they have to give up the idea of their peoplehood because you cannot, quote, have a nation within a nation, like we asked, right? But this is the political thing. And then this worldview that is partly, pro that is in great extent, propaganda about stereotypes about Jews. That the only, that if, like with the Nazis, if we're going to be a pure Aryan race, then who do we get rid of? Because, first of all, they're white. They were white, right? Threat white, right? <coughs> pure Aryan race. So they have this fantasy. This is called social constructivism. Okay? Social construction. That for the perfect society, then they had to get rid of all these Jews. Annihilation. And I'm sorry about this picture because it's pretty hard to take. These were children over here. I have worked with Holocaust survivors and in my own family Part of my family uh, were killed in the Holocaust. I worked with Holocaust survivors in Israel. And um, anyway, then we'll go into that. So, and a lot of those people remember the German people and the people in the countries that Germany took over. They allowed this to happen. They were <coughs> silent. So if you're silent, you are as much a contributor and a perpetrator as the person who is killing you. Yes? Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to throw in before we got moved on that in most of Eastern Europe, the occupied peoples were just as much an active perpetrator. And sometimes they did. If you look at like the work of Jan Gross in Poland, a lot of times they didn't need a lot of encouragement from the occupying forces to engage in elimination. Well, you're absolutely right, because in Eastern Europe, my, my father's side of the family were from Poland, and in Eastern Europe they had had centuries of, and Russia, pogroms, living in ghettos, you know, kind of a ventilating <coughs> factor for all their frustration. So, yeah, it wasn't out of the norm, but many were Christian. And later, of course, uh, I don't mean later, but eventually Christians and gypsies were also <coughs> killed, right? And then, of course, anybody who did stand up. So I already talked about this issue of self-sanctioning. The problem that we're facing in the United States with the hate crimes, the increasing hate crimes, and the rhetoric from radical groups that have come out, I don't know if anybody, if, you know, have come out from under the rock, it's becoming normatized. It's becoming normative to hear these kinds of dangerous statements, and I will move on. Now, one of the theories, too, is a nation-state theory, because Nations are created in order to protect their citizens by force, if necessary, 
while at the same time, particularly in a democracy, they're supposed to be protecting human rights. And you have this kind of, you know, if you're on a seesaw, when I was a kid I only sat down, I never tried to stand up on it. But you try to maintain some kind of a, a balance. And then, to maintain your sovereignty, you have to project, we're back to social construct uh, construction kinds of ideas, what unity and nationalism means. When someone is delegitimized or a group is delegitimized out of that portrait of unity and it's accepted as normative, it's dangerous. It's dangerous because we go back to Bandura's psychological explanation of sanctioning that it's okay, we can sanction, give permission for marginalization and delegitimization for whatever reason. So what I've got up here is that even in America we hear this about what is, what is being an American and who is a real American, right? So, and then, Bandura didn't rule out completely individual personality factors. And in sociology, you can read about theories like the authoritarian theory that people who have been abused, who, who then, who, who have inferiority issues, who have lower self-esteem, join a group that promises them an identity. An identity with power and an identity to vent their anger. So, if you put these groups, these people together, then you have a collective identity, and we're right, we have the right way, nobody else has the right way, and we are going to show and exert our power. Well, one of the things that's come down through the centuries is well, the Jews want to control everything. They control the banks. Well, sorry, I was going to swear. <coughs> I wish I was part of that. But, okay. And, you know, they want to take over the world, blah, blah, blah. And now that, uh, I don't know why it hasn't attached to Bernie yet, but it has attached to Bloomberg, that Bloomberg is proof that the Jews want to take over the country. Maybe because he has more money than Bernie. I haven't figured that one out. Bernie's Jewish. So, here we are. Centuries of these conspiracy theories never goes away. It's always there. And, where do, and, and within these groups, they have their own language. They have their own rhetoric. They have their own language. They have their own shirts with signs. They have their own identity. And what did we hear at Charlottesville? I just wondered where the hell that came from. The Jews will not replace us. Where the hell, where did they think they were? I have no idea. And guess what? Did anybody say anything about that? They said something about the girl who got murdered, unfortunately, right? But I didn't see anything about that this slogan that was being propagated. Now, I have told students over and over and over again in my classes, in social work we teach advocacy too, that people do what they do because they think they can. And guess what? They usually can. And the question is, why do they think they can? <coughs> Why do these people think they can come out now in the public sphere over and over again? 
I don't even think most of them ever met a Jew, and if they did, they, I don't know. Another theory that goes along with this is the in-group and out-group theory, where they feel threatened by outsiders. <laughs> I went, now, this is, not a, this is not an extreme, but I went to a, my first couple years here in Hayes, it was quite a shock, and because I'm not rural, obviously, and uh, obviously because I grew up in Seattle. So I went to a small town north of here, and I walked into a small cafe restaurant, and the old people were there doing whatever they do, and I walked in and it was, and I don't think it was, you know, being a woman. I think it was just that they knew I was an outsider, okay? I try not to practice. You know, that would make a good research. <laughs> okay. But what happens is, of course, um, whether we realize it or not, when we evolved as human beings, we evolved with certain instincts, instinctive drives. And although we cover it up with our cognitive civilizations and cultures, etc., we're not very far from our instincts. It's the instinct of the pact. Did I say that right? Pact. And so what happens is when man evolved, they have this pact mentality for survival purposes. And what we're seeing is different levels of this in every day. So one, you love your in-group. And two, don't come too close. We're going to keep you this way. We also uh, have evolved with aggression. And under what circumstances can we allow ourselves to throw, I mean, to throw a temper tantrum or to show aggression and anger? So this is uh, another, and when the rhetoric is being stated against Jews, the rhetoric includes this issue about the Jews are going to take over the world, they want to, you know, they want to get rid of the rest of us, blah, 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 blah. All right? We're a threat. Okay, Freud, believe it or not, also wrote about anti-Semitism. And what's interesting is that in the books on Freud's psychology, see almost I uh, watched a film from the library here on Freud's life, and it mentioned that he had been Jewish, but what it didn't look at was the effects of his being Jewish and how, how and why what motivated him to move in the direction of developing, of all things, a theory on sex. I want to get people's attention in the, in the old days. That was a way to do it. But I can't speak for Freud. Freud said that... He thought that there were theological origins of anti-Semitism in Christianity. And that with the Jews being the first monotheistic religion, if then Christianity had to explain or restructure its concept of a tie to God and how they would restructure their beliefs in contrast to Jews. And when they did this, basically there were metaphors and myths perpetrated that it, the Jews were bad and the Christians were good. And so that, like for instance, during the Crusades, they tried to blame the Jews, um, um, that when their black death happened, it was because of the Jews, and etc. And I don't, this was Freud's views, because where he lived in Europe, Jews were definitely a minority. And he must have, I expect, experienced discrimination. 
but we don't know about it because it's not, I mean, I haven't run across that. Um, we had an interfaith panel here a few years ago, and I was asked to come up on this. It was in Cody Commons, and it was somebody from, uh, who was Muslim, and somebody from the Catholic Church, and somebody, I don't know. And I made a statement, I mean, because one of the things that happens is that people have believed that the Jews killed Jesus. Okay. So when I was in, uh, after the, I said I, <laughs> it was the Romans, and no, it didn't happen, and since when did the Jews at that point bear such weight with the Roman authorities? Um, they were second class citizens, and they were living in a closed neighborhoods, etc. But anyway, afterwards, and got off the stage, I'm walking out of Cody Commons to go up the elevator, and this big top student stands in front of me, and he's almost in hysteria. Okay, I'm a social worker, <coughs> so nothing new for me. So he stood there, he's almost in hysteria, and he says, I don't care what you say, you killed Jesus. I didn't know Jesus, but, you know. So, and when I was in high school, I had a best friend who was of a Christian denomination. I won't say which. We were supposed to meet at her church. She was a very good friend. She was teaching Sunday school. And I was standing, get this, 17 years of age. I'm standing outside the church, and I hear little tiny voices piping, Who killed Jesus? The Jews killed Jesus. Who killed Jesus? The Jews killed Jesus. I'm standing out there and I'm thinking, I must have been an activist even then. I went in. Here are these little three or four year olds sitting on the floor with four youth leaders or whatever they were, including my friend. And I walked in and I said, what? The Jews didn't kill Jesus, the Romans did. Oh, so then they started the mantra all over again. Who killed Jesus? The Romans killed Jesus. Now, I stood there for about 15 minutes, and I thought, well, how long can I stand here? Because I'm sure when I walk out, it's going to go back. You want to teach anti-Semitism against Jews? This was the seriousness of it. So, this was Freud's idea that it was Christianity that, that fomented anti-Semitism. Okay, let's talk about the outright, you know? They were the ones in Charlottesville. Okay, and the outright has had a problem in the United States in that they have gone many years being marginalized themselves. So they have militaristic ideas. And by the way, they used military tactics when at the Charlottesville uh, incident. They, they had organized, they or, organized, I don't know what you call it militarily, but they had organized a back line to keep people back. They organized their people along the side and then went down, and then the others went down. Um, what's very interesting about this is that they have identified Jews as racial. And I managed to pull up a few years back their application for the KKK. And then not long after there, after that, uh, it was the website disappeared. <coughs> But on there, they had a definition of unacceptable groups. And I read this out in one of my diversity classes. I got to white trash, and one of my girls raised her hands and said, that's me. And then somebody said, you haven't seen the, the trailer park, because I thought there was no slum in case. I don't know if that's true. At any rate, they've always been, since nativism, 
in the early 1900s when we, they were behind the uh, rigid, rigidifying of the immigration law in 1924. Um, it was basically to limit Jews and Italians coming to the States. And, um, that, and the problem is that for the white right, they see Jews as white, but we're not white enough to be Americans. Okay? So therefore, we can compete. I know some of you may not agree with me, and afterwards we'll have that discussion. Okay, this is what all of this, as you see, is cited. It doesn't mean it's true, but all of it is cited. So, and they see Jews as a racial enemy who are evil, and they can do what they need to do. We're back to Bandura's sanctioning. They can do what they do, even if it's evil, but in good conscience, because it's deserved. They can justify it. Well, then we have the radical left. <laughs> you may not know a whole lot about the radical left, but they're very active in the East, particularly at like universities like Columbia. And they say, we're not anti-Jewish, we're just anti-Zionism. <coughs> We're anti-Israel, but they've been having a tremendous amount of trouble, uh, and they claim that Jews and they see Jews in Israel as white, and I told you that for the most part they're not, <laughs> and therefore they're imperialistic and racist. They're also funded by Palestinian organizations. Um, I'm not saying anything against Palestinians because that's a whole different sad sad issue. But what has happened on those campuses is that Jewish students who have an organization called Hillel have tried to join, you know, left organizations and they have been refused. They have been assaulted physically and it has spread to other campuses in the in the East for the most part. We don't have a BDS movement here, because how many Jews have we got anyway? But if we had stores selling Israeli goods, they might show up and try to uh, strike. You know, um, it's not called a strike. Boycott. Yes, boycott these stores. So it's, a diff it's the kind of thing of with the white right, we're not white enough, and with the left right, and with the left radical, we're too white. Therefore, we're imperialistic and racist. Okay, um, and people think they're they're less dangerous, <coughs> but they're not. It's just coming from a different different side. So this was a this was the white right that wanted to boycott Israel, etc. They probably have never been to Israel, probably don't know much about Israel, but they again, brainwashing, whatever you want to call it, propaganda. Um, and if you notice, one of the things that's been said, it said in the last one, Free Palestine, the the thing is, one of the questions that was raised in one of the readings that I did was, well, why aren't they protesting North Korea? Or why aren't they protesting China? Because probably, I don't know why. But what I suspect is we're back to the old stereotypes. Because they can. That's why. Now, here's an interesting take. And 2000, uh, I think 2000, hmm, 2008, when Barack Obama was running for president, there were citizens in America who were white, 
mostly, according to the, the research, mainly evangelical Christian, who, and I don't know a lot about that, and who felt that they had been betrayed. They felt that, that when Obama became president, that they, that we no longer had pre the, we hadn't kept the presidential tradition of having a white president, and that we should have been going by the original Constitution. Um, it says without the 13th and 17th. 13th is the one that abolishes slavery, and I believe, you can check me on this, and the 17th is about voting rights. So in other words, we have this split of what and who is the real America and real American. So the Tea Party formed, and the guy who wrote the article on this was from KU, a professor from KU, he and another guy, and they did the research on this, and they found that they tried to work politically. Um, they felt that they were victims of the Civil Rights Movement, and that whites were being dispossessed. And some of them even talked about the Jews being behind all this. Okay? Um, but they were mainly older citizens, and they did have some success in electing Tea Party representatives into Congress. The reason I bring this up is that there is a question of whether the Tea Party people, uh, the people who were members of the Tea Party, are now part of the conservative Republican that it evolved. They were anti-immigration, etc. Just to keep an ear open. And they <coughs> called themselves white slaves. Okay, I, I say that because I have no idea what slavery feels like. Okay, and they, this was a 5,000 uh, protest, 5,000 member protest in front of the White House at that time. And I told you, it just never ends. It gets really, after a while you get to feel really tired with all of this. So, we have a split America, if we're still talking about Tea Party people, where, like I said, it, it's pre a certain time. And then we have from the 60s, with the emphasis on civil rights and human rights, and we see it in our own university, we're constantly talking about diversity and respect and acceptance. Etc. And I tell my students the playgrounds that you played on when you were little are not going to look like that. The, your children's playgrounds are not going to look the same. So when you're out there doing counseling, you're going to have to be ready for that, right? But that's my professional opinion. So we have kind of a split America right now. It's it's not so straightforward, obviously. So there's some questions. How can someone's life be ended for back to annihilation over an identity over which you had no choice? My, my grandmother, who was a really witty little lady, she had a daughter who converted to Christianity. And she grabbed my hand one day and she said, Patricia, born a Jew, die a Jew. Okay. <laughs> that was her. And she was very assimilated into American life. No healthy society harbors extensive anti-Semitism. Because what have we seen in history? These kinds of dangers turn inward on your own society. It will eventually catch up with others. And 
inclusion in a democracy as a society means listening to our differences and honoring the right of everyone to talk about their reality. <coughs> However, who killed Jesus? The Jews killed Jesus? I don't think so. <coughs> so much for free speech. Okay. We have a saying, supposedly, I don't know if it's true, the story I was told, by a rabbi who was said, he was asked, I think it was Hillel, who was asked to give a, what was Judaism, and the student came to him and he said, stand on one leg. <laughs> I don't believe that. This is probably just one of those stories. But this, this is a very common saying in Israel in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it's a very common saying. If I'm not for myself, who will be? If I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Please, if you see discrimination in front of your eyes, don't remain silent. That's my message. Thank you. Or anything? Or did I just blow you all away? <laughs> I guess, Patricia, I just add that I see you quoting Debbie Lipstadt a couple times. That's right. We do have her new book, Anti Semitism Healing oh. Now, in which she. There's. Oh, great. I Deb. think the bibliography <laughs> is on here. Wonderful. Um, and she's just phenomenal about really dissecting anti-Semitism on all points of the spectrum and the different manifestations. I don't know where, oh, there it is at the bottom. Uh, it's not always elimination, an eliminationist in nature. It could be even promoting a positive stereotype, right? Um, it can be political anti-Semitism. Um, point out in 2018, during the Kansas governor's race, we had television ads in which a candidate Basically, Gordon just implied, he stated that George Soros was funding the ACLU to propagate excessive immigration in the United States and was pushing back against this candidate's policies. So be aware of, we're entering into an election cycle now, so I mean, be aware of the kind of things you see. It plays into the, to the, the Jews as global puppet master canode, so... I wanted to just add one thing. I asked, uh, when I was teaching the diversity class on campus, I asked the students, at what point would you get involved if there was an act of discrimination in front of you or near you? And they said, well, that class, and I don't know what your opinion on you young people here. They said, well, we probably wouldn't get involved if it wasn't on our doorstep. How do you guys feel? How do you feel about it? If you saw a friend or you're standing in a bank line, yes? I think if you're questioning that, that tells you that something's wrong and you should try to make it right. So you, you think you, what would you do? Probably just... Say, say what it is for what it is, and just point it out. At the time. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Might be embarrassing. I think yeah. that's the issue. Is like a lot of a lot of students, I think, struggle to answer that question. Like, what would I do? Because I've never really been in that situation, so I don't know if I'm in it. But I think, like, realistically, they have been in those situations many a times. Just like if you're in the locker room talking with people who all share the same identity as you and you say something about a different people group, like, you're in that situation right then and there. And and I think just it's even in those small conversations about, like, we got to challenge even just the way we joke, the way we talk, the things that we're giggling at or retweeting, you know, like, all that stuff matters. And that's how you approach it even without having to like step up and be some hero right in front of everybody, but just in those small conversations behind closed doors where you feel like no one else is watching. I think like that's where the common student, at least in Hayes, Kansas, probably can make a very large difference because any of the ar larger societal issues are very well like under the rug and kind of like behind closed doors a lot of the times in our community, which is a big issue itself. So. Maybe when you're out at the bar for drinking. I hear Courtney's students are excellent drinkers. But <laughs> not that I'm telling you to be. <laughs> okay. 
But it does come out in informal talk, not just about Jews, but about whatever yeah. against women or men or whatever. Um, and the thing is, is it takes practice. The first time is stepping up is takes practice. The first time is kind of kind of difficult sometimes. So in high school, we used to call it bullying, right? You, uh, how many people have bullies in their high school? Okay. So if you see something like this, then you know how to categorize that. Thank you. I think another, like, when, when, oh, excuse me. When you see, um, you know, like, discrimination or something like here, or like, you know, like, World War II with, like, the German Jewish um, <coughs> people, is people don't want to get involved because they're afraid that they do, that those people will turn on them. But they can be guaranteed that, you know, if they get involved, the discrimination will stop, and then they'll remain fine, but, you know, they might do that, but a lot of the times they're afraid that if they get involved, those people will turn on them, and so they kind of want to look out for them. Well, everyone wants to uh, take care of themselves. The problem is, is if it goes too far, it will eventually come to you, or can come to you. Yes? It reminds me of that one uh, poem or something like that, uh, First They Came to the Jews, where it talks about first they came to the Jews, um, and no one spoke up, then they came for like um, uh, blacks, no one spoke up, then they came for the disabled, nobody spoke up, and eventually they came to you, there was nobody left to speak up. I was a Christian minister. Was it Christian minister? Good for him. Yeah. Yes. Great, great resistance from both sides, both sides of the Catholic and uh, uh, Protestant divide uh, that you find in <coughs> uh, Our society is one where, from the time you were in public school, you are socialized to being competitive. Com competition. We're, we're by nature not a communal society like the Japanese or I have a Japanese daughter-in-law. And you know when you get grades, when we grade you, we make you competitive. And I think part of that is that when you see something happen, you know, it might be a one-up for you, their loss is your gain, or whatever. I, I don't know how much people are really socialized, and I believe that we are, like in church or whatever, to care about others and to step forward as a community. Yes, sir. Well, that's what I, what I wanted to ask about. Something you, you brought out about two different two different points in your talk, Patricia. One was that the the idea that young people are socialized to hate well I don't that it's know. all that it's a socially constructed problem but then you also uh, made the assertion uh, that there's an evolutionary psychology of of competition of outgrouping of aggression right we, what side does it really fall on for you well, <laughs> I boy, I wish I could answer for a whole group but First of all, being a social worker, you know that individual family environments and culture plays a, a major role as to what you get socialized to. And then if you get socialized on, uh, in terms of what you act upon. So I have students who fill out what I call a cultural inventory uh, online, and, and they talk about how they were raised and what their values are and what they learn. And one of the thing one of the questions is at what point uh, at what point were you exposed to people who were different? And how uh, what things are expected from you in terms of your culture? What things are not expected? And of course every student's paper reads differently. So I think parents have a great have a great responsibility. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of families where we don't have parents at home. And, 
you know, that's another topic, but I really don't know if we did a favor for women being, for, for having to have two parents work while the, parent, while the kids are occupying themselves on social media or whatever. I don't know how much guidance they're getting. So I, I don't think it's an either or. I think it depends upon the family composition, their history, their ancestry, their belief system. But I think when it goes community wide, such as what I heard in the church with those little kids, it's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Thank you.